God commands Abraham to leave everything and go. And so, 75-year-old Abraham obeys God right away. And two verses later, it is written, So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. Abraham goes out and follows the commandment of God. The first step that Abraham takes in the Lech Lecha portion is one of the most important and meaningful steps in human history. It was the first step of mankind in reconnection with God. The Torah tells us that Abraham was chosen and how through him, in a miraculous way, God created a nation that is supposed to spread the word of the living God in the world, to spread knowledge about God and to teach morality, virtue, love, grace, charity, mercy, justice, and so on. God orders Abraham, get yourself out of your country and go to the land that I will show you. At the beginning of the Torah portion, immediately after the famous call of God, comes the promise. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. If we are looking for what Abraham's descendants gave to mankind, we can find a lot. We won several Nobel Prizes, invented many things, including Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. There is no doubt that the descendants of Abraham had and still have many gifts that benefit humanity. But the most important gift of all is the faith of Abraham. That the knowledge of God was spread throughout the world. That is why, as believers, we see the fulfillment of that prophecy in Yeshua. He was born a Jew from Israel. And because of him, the message of hope, salvation, security, and knowledge of God reached even the far corners of the earth. It is because of Yeshua that our world knows about the God of Abraham. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, was fulfilled in Yeshua the Messiah. He came to save the world, to bless the world, and to give it hope, faith, redemption. Yeshua is the seed of Abraham. The New Testament opens with the following words. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The issue of being chosen is mentioned in the New Testament several times, in Romans, Ephesians, and other places. As we read in our Haftarah from Isaiah 40, 41, we understand that God chose the nation of Israel, the seed of Abraham, as Abraham was the first to follow God. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, offspring of Abraham, whom I love. Only through the power of love could Abraham withstand his trials. Only through the power of love could the 75-year-old Abraham get up and walk away from everything familiar, from everything safe, and to follow God into the unknown. In the same manner of love, Yeshua's disciples left everything to follow Him. Then Peter said, See, we have left all and followed you. And today, Yeshua invites us to follow Him, to walk in the light as Yeshua declares, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. As believers, we choose to follow Yeshua in love. And where is He leading us? Towards a connection with God 
towards a connection with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God chose Abraham. God chose the seed of Abraham. God did not choose the nation of Israel because they are the strongest, the smartest, or the most successful people. No. He chose this nation because he had sworn to our fathers, because he made a promise of love to Abraham, and he is faithful to his promises. That is what is written in Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 and 8. For you are holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. And the reason why they were chosen is given in the following passage. Because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. We, Jews of the land of Israel, are standing here today as the living proof that there is a God in heaven. We are the real physical proof that he exists and his words and prophecies are true. We are the real physical proof of God's fulfilledness of his promises. Previous generations could only dream of the reality we live in today. Some didn't even dare to dream about it, as it seemed too far-fetched to think that one day we will return back and resettle the promised land, the land of Israel. God miraculously brought us back from the four corners of the earth as he had spoken through Moses and all the prophets, as God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, that as long as the sun the moon, and the stars of heaven exist, so will the seed of Israel exist before God forever. Here, we have to give proper thanks to the Christian Zionist vision that existed long before Herzl, the visionary of the state. Without the help and support of Christian Zionists, we would probably still ride donkeys here in Israel. Before the state of Israel came to be, Christian Zionists invested in the infrastructure of the land. They built here schools and hospitals. Until this very day, many of our public institutions, schools, hospitals, university campuses, museums, parks, research facilities, and charities are funded by Christian Zionists. Their love for our country is based on our common connection to the Word of God. The State of Israel and also us as Nativia owe a lot to the Christian Zionists. The fruits of their hands was and still is a blessing. Let's get back to our Torah portion. Last week, at the very end of the previous portion, we've heard the name of Raham, or Abram, for the first time. This week, we continue to learn about the greatest believer of all, the role model of faith of Raham. When the New Testament authors are looking for an example of faith that is true, active, and alive, they use Abraham as such an example. He is the eternal prototype of the man of faith. That is why Abraham is mentioned in the New Testament so many times. When we think of Abraham, the image imprinted in our minds is of a superhero and an unreachable figure, a legend. But when the Torah describes its heroes, it doesn't portray them in 
absolute colors of black and white. Was Abraham a perfect figure? Or even he faced some difficulties. Maybe even Abraham dealt with doubts and questions. Maybe even he had doubts of faith. Did Abraham laugh as well? Did Abraham want to give up hope for a son from Sarah, willing to see the son of promise as Ishmael? Did Abraham go down to Egypt and feared that he could be killed there? Did he not believe that God would protect him? The Word of God teaches us that life is a process of growth and learning. And even the best, the greatest, are sometimes wrong. And even the wicked have positive qualities. This idea is hard to comprehend because we are taught from childhood that there is a hero which, who is good and there is a villain who is bad. We learned it from, as kids from Bible stories, from children's Disney movies, from comics, and so on. There's good and there's evil. This is nice. But it is not real, not true. As children, yes, we learn to distinguish between allowed and forbidden, between good and bad. But when we grow up, we begin to understand that some decisions are hard. And at times, you can only choose the lesser of two evils. Today, tomorrow, next week, and for the rest of our lives, there will be hard choices and complicated decisions to make. To leave for Egypt or stay in the land and deal with hunger. To tell that Sarah is my wife and to risk our well-being or to play safe. To have pity on Ishmael, the son of a slave, and risk a bad influence or perhaps even harm to Isaac, the son whom God destined as a son of promise, or to send Ishmael and Hagar away from home to die in the desert. It is important to understand that not only are the decisions difficult, but people are also complicated creatures. The Bible does not paint its heroes black and white but rather in different shades of gray. Noah, the only person in the Bible who is called righteous, he gets so drunk, he couldn't tell up from down, as they say. Moses, Aaron, Miriam are all punished for their sins. And so is King David, the symbol of the Messianic King and his son, Solomon, the wisest man on earth, they all sinned. We need to understand that the Bible is true and the people it tells us about are real people who lived and acted. The Bible doesn't try to make them into saints or superheroes. And on the opposite side, we have anti-heroes like Esau, who are not completely evil, as he respects and loves his father, whom he doesn't want to hurt. And afterwards, when he met Jacob, he hugged him and cried. He loved and forgave his brother. God doesn't ask us to be perfect. He asks us to seek him, to serve him, to seek and long for his kingdom to try and do what is good and right in His eyes. However, through the Bible, He wants us to understand that on our way to His kingdom, we are most likely going to make mistakes, like all other humans. As believers, we understand that the Word of God allows us to acknowledge our mistake. Yeshua allows us to repent, to re-examine 
our lives, in our decisions, and then march towards the change. This is what our life is about. Our life alongside Yeshua. Shabbat Shalom.